here at the Middle East Institute. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are very, very fortunate uh, to be joined by Ambassador Robert Hunter, who will be talking about the need to better define a long-term security strategy for the Persian Gulf, or as our Arab allies call it, the Arabian Gulf, uh, especially given the winding down of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, troop presence in Iraq and the growing muscle flexing of Iran. He's written a book about this topic uh, in his Iran publication, Building Security in the Persian Gulf. He'll be signing it today after this event here in this room. Of course, the U.S. has been uh, engaged in the Gulf for decades now, ever since we took over from the British in the uh, 50s, and Gulf security has long been obviously a top priority um, for U.S. security, uh, given our dependence on Gulf oil. Uh, and of course, we've gone to war to protect those interests. And I'm speaking here of Operation Desert Storm. I think the jury is still out on why we went to war in 2003. Uh, but given the many new, new dynamics in the region, uh, a, a different Iraq, uh, a more hegemonic Iran, a potentially nuclear Iran, it's certainly a very important time to re-examine our uh, security strategies and our strategies for enhancing security alliances um, and uh, for figuring figure out ways to do so at a much lower cost all of which Ambassador Hunter addresses in his book. He certainly had a lot of time to um, observe the evolution of Gulf security. Uh, throughout the Carter administration, uh, Hunter served on the National Security Council staff and was responsible for West European affairs and later Middle Eastern affairs. <coughs> He's currently a senior advisor at the Rand Corporation, as well as a senior international consultant to Lockheed Martin, chairman of the Council for Community Democracies, and serves on the senior advisory group to the U.S. European Command. From 1993 to 1998, Robert Hunter was U.S. Ambassador to NATO and represented the U.S. to the Western European Union. And those are just a few of the many uh, distinguished highlights in his career. So thank you once again for joining us. But before we, we begin a few uh, announcements, we have next week an event that we're co-hosting with the Foundation for Middle East Peace over at Carnegie. Uh, we're hosting a researcher at Hebrew University who's an expert on uh, Israeli uh, Golan Heights, uh, Israeli Syrian Golan Heights relations. His name is Yigal Kipnis. He'll be joining us on October 8th at Carnegie from noon to 1. And then the following Tuesday, October 12th, we have a retired Marine Colonel, Thomas Hammes, uh, who a very fascinating man who's going to be talking about the growth of private contractors in the military and the impact that they're having both on current and future conflicts. Uh, and then finally, we have our annual conference on Thursday, November 4th. You should all have flyers on your seats on the back. We have a list of all the panels. Uh, I very much hope you can join us for that. Our keynote luncheon speaker that day is Saab Arakat, who, uh, barring any unforeseen uh, uh, peace developments, uh, will be joining us as the luncheon keynote speaker. So um, please do join us for some or all of those. And in the meantime, join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Hunter. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, for that generous introduction. After that, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> uh, thanks also to the Middle East Institute for your leadership uh, on dealing with a set of complex issues which are never easy, especially in American politics. But uh, uh, what you do, I think, uh, greatly informs the, uh, the debate. Uh, what have I done already? So, how do we turn this off? I don't want to obscure my own book. Oh, the excellent. No, sorry. Where's the mouse? Oh, here it is. Wait a second. Let's do this one. There we go. Here we go. I don't want to step on my own work here. Uh, and I'm very grateful to all of you for coming here today. It's a little bit intimidating because I see a lot of expertise out here, including some, some old friends. It's uh, like the occasion of a man back in the 1870s who survived the Johnstown Flood. All of you are too young to remember that, and some of you may have heard of it, but this guy survived it, and the rest of his life, all he could talk about was how I survived the Johnstown Flood. He got to the point he died and was uh, taken to his eternal reward to heaven, and uh, St. Peter said, is there anything I can do for you? He says, oh yes, I'd like to be able to talk to some people about how I survived the Johnstown flood. He said, piece of cake, so no problem. So they got together a group of the heavenly host, and the man got up there to talk about it, and St. Peter said, oh, by the way, before you start, I just want to let you know, 
Uh, that man sitting in the front row, uh, that's Noah. <laughs> um, I'm also taking on a difficult subject here, building security in the Persian Gulf, in particular trying to talk about building a structure for security that might have some capacity to inform the way countries behave in the future, because it really is like herding kittens. The question is whether it is of such compelling requirement that we may find the political willpower in one or another place, various places, uh, to overcome the difficulties. In the first place, I think we have to recognize that uh, such security structure as there was was uh, shattered by the war in Iraq. Uh, we now have a kind of free-for-all in the region uh, in which the expectations of behavior of one country to another and what there might be in the future is uh, 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 de minimis. We also have a problem in this country, if I might say, and I'm looking at this primarily from the point of view of American interests, in which I would argue that between the Levant and the Hindu Kush, there are seven separate issues. They are all, in fact, one issue with seven parts, all interconnected. The risk is that we will look at them as seven separate issues without understanding how they are interconnected. Uh, for example, just today when we're talking about Arab Israeli peacemaking, I would say that you cannot even consider moving forward and being successful, not just within the next year, which is the, uh, uh, the timeline, but beyond that, unless the Persian Gulf security situation is also sorted out in a major respect, and particularly in regard to the future of Iran. There is always in every region what I would call a security system. How do people behave towards one another? It is different, however, from having a structure. A structure that can create expectations, rules of the road, and a framework, whether informal or formal, which will lead the member countries, the people the countries living in, at least a sufficient number of them to say, I would rather work within this framework and somewhat limit my ambitions than be in a state of anarchy. Uh, clearly, this has happened in the North Atlantic area. It also happened during the Cold War in relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. An issue to be borne in mind now as we look to relations with Iran. Whether there can be some kind of recognition of the need to have a mutual understanding of security requirements. Well, 